Okay, I think it's time to go to work. Uh, that's, it's already the fourth week of the quarter, so one of the things I wanted to do is to start with the bottom and say a few words about the midterm so that we're all on the same page together. The, the midterm is a week from Friday, it's February 8th, and it's going to cover all of the material through the lecture on February 4th, which is through next Monday's lecture. It will not cover Wednesday's, February 6th material. The style of the midterm is going to be pretty similar to the quizzes. So if you've done well on the quizzes, you should do well on the midterm. If you haven't done well on the quizzes, you should look at them carefully and analyze why you haven't done well. But that will be the style of the midterm. Um, one other thing that I want to tell you is that next week I'll have my office hour on Monday instead of Wednesday. Monday from 2 to 3, it'll be the same time after Monday's lecture. I, I have another meeting all day next, a week from Wednesday. That's, I'm talking now about next week, February 4th. I'll have my office hour Monday, February 4th, instead of Wednesday, February 6th. Same time and location, but I'm tied up in another meeting all day on that Wednesday, and so cannot meet with anybody then. So let's, let's now start off with, yes, mm-hmm. Will we have a practice midterm that we can use? Will we what? Have a practice midterm that we can use? Well, um, you know, I've looked at some of the old midterms, and I'm a little worried that they're more misleading than helpful. So um, I think the best guide is the quizzes. And I've posted all the quizzes and their answers on the uh, website for the course. One other thing to say is that I notice that people aren't using the message board at all. But you can use that also, especially if you have well-articulated questions because it helps everybody else to hear your questions. So um, study the quizzes, yes. I'm sorry. Is it all multiple Yes, it will all be multiple choice, right. It's going to be Scantron graded, so. Okay, so let me begin now with a, just a brief review of some of the topics we talked about in the last lecture to launch us into this lecture. We began by talking about bacteria and archaea, um, two of the three domains of life. Today we're going to talk about protists, which are a big part of the third domain, the um, eukaryotes. And we talked about disease and the fact that bacteria are an important source of human disease. We, we mentioned that there's only one human disease so far identified, and it's a dental disease. It's not a fatal disease or anything, identified with archaea. So for all intents and purposes, we don't know of serious human diseases associated with archaea. But there are lots associated with bacteria, and we saw a list of bacterial diseases. And then we, we talked about Koch's postulates. Um, Koch was a very important figure in the history of medicine and biology because he helped establish beyond the quest shadow of a doubt the germ theory of disease. So very important figure, one of the earliest Nobel Prize winners in medicine and physiology. And he enunciated four postulates that had to be satisfied to demonstrate that an organism actually caused a human disease. And that was the organism had to be associated with individuals who manifested the disease. That's number one. Number two, you had to be able to culture the organism from the infected individual and grow it separately. Number three, you had to take 
cells from that culture and use it to reinfect an experimental animal and show that the animal became sick and demonstrated the disease symptoms. And finally, number four, you had to be able to reculture the same organism from the experimental animal that you had infected. And if you did all of those things, you proved that there was a causal connection between the disease and the bacterium. We went on to talk about the fact that many archaea and bacteria are extremophiles, that is, they live in extreme environments. We'll see a couple of more examples of that in this lecture. We talked about the oxygen revolution. This is one of the major events in the history of, of the Earth, the physical history, the geological history, as well as the biological history, was the evolution of photosynthesis which actually transformed the composition of the atmosphere of the Earth. And the reason is that photosynthesis splits a molecule of water, and the electron is donated, splits a molecule of water, high oxygen gas, O2, is released from the reaction into the atmosphere. So after the evolution of photosynthesis, the atmosphere was gradually transformed to an oxygenated atmosphere, which was very important for us because we require oxygen in our electron transport system for the generation of ATP. So we're a result of the oxygen revolution. Now, we, you can actually date it reasonably well because you can see the first appearances of oxides of iron at about 2.3 billion years ago or so in geological formations indicating the appearance of oxygen, free oxygen in the atmosphere. We talked about the nitrogen cycle, talked about the fact that we can't, even though the atmosphere, the majority gas in the atmosphere is nitrogen in two, we can't utilize it and nitrogen is critical for amino acids and for purines and pyrimidines, so we need a source of nitrogen for our metabolism and for the building blocks of our structures. And that happens to come from a very small segment of life. It's from bacteria and archaea, which are capable of fixing atmospheric nitrogen into nitrates and ammonia. And we saw an example of a very very important segment of the bacterial world, rhizobia, which do fix nitrogen and which actually live in a symbiotic association, many do, in a symbiotic association with plant roots in nodules. And that's where a lot of the, with the nitrogen that, that eukaryotes, plants or eukaryotes, get for their metabolism. So if something happened to rhizobia, we'd be in deep trouble because our source of nitrogen for plant growth would be wiped out. Now I mentioned that we've sort of overcome that in the last hundred years because nitrates are also important as explosives and during World War I, Germany didn't have a good source of nitrates and the uh, German chemical industry actually invented synthetic means of making nitrates for explosives. And in fact, what's TNT? It's tri-nitrotoluene. Alfred Nobel made his fortune from TNT. So the origin of the Nobel Prizes is actually based on the industry creating explosives. Cyanobacteria are also important um, examples of bacteria which fix nitrogen, and we'll see one picture in a moment or two. We talked about methods for studying bacteria and archaea. I mentioned enrichment cultures, particularly in, the con in connection with a fabulous discovery of the last 20 years or so that bacteria actually live in essentially rock structures thousands of feet under the ground. And uh, we saw an, uh, 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 the use of a 
Enrichment culture has a way of demonstrating that there was bacterial life and material removed from these deep drills. Then we talked about direct sequencing as a very important means for discovering new branches of life. In fact, this is the most powerful means, but it's really only come into uh, great use in the last 10 or 15 years with the elaboration of ever more efficient sequencing techniques. And, and finally, I ended up uh, talk, beginning to talk about metabolic diversity in bacteria. And I said that, that bacteria can use three different sources of energy to generate ATP, which is the molecular energy currency of all of life. They can use light through photosynthesis as a way of generating ATP through an electron transport process called photophosphorylation. They can use organic molecules. That's what we do, too. We take organic molecules, break them down to release energy to use for synthesis. Or they can use inorganic molecules. And we saw an example of the use of inorganic molecules when we talked about the use of ferric as an electron acceptor from the bacteria deep under the earth. So um, there are three different ways that bacteria can get energy. And that's shown across the top. Each of these columns is labeled with a different way. Phototrophs, light producers, chemoorganotrophs, or chemolithotrophs. Lithotrope meaning rock or stone. And then down the, the rows label the source of carbon-carbon bonds. You could have photoautotrophs. What's a good example of a photoautotroph? Well, a green plant is, because green plants actually build up carbon-carbon bonds from carbon dioxide, which is added to a five-carbon sugar called ribulose-1,5-bisphosphate, and then split into two, two new three-carbon sugars in what's called the Calvin cycle of photosynthesis. That's the beginnings of the buildup of all carbon-carbon bonds in plants. But bacteria do that too, again, especially um, cyanobacteria. You can have chemoorganotrophs. These are uh, organisms which get <coughs> organic um, molecules from some in source and uh, then chemolithotrophs. And finally, you have photoheterotrophs, chemoorganotrophs, and chemotropic heterotrophs. So this are the six ways that bacteria can make a living. Three ways of getting energy and two ways of getting carbon-carbon bonds. They're either an autotroph, they build up the carbon-carbon bonds as plants do in photosynthesis, or they're a heterotroph, they get the molecules from other organisms, which is what we are. We're heterotrophs. We get our carbon-carbon bonds by eating other animals and plants and digesting the complex molecules that they're composed of. So bacteria are very diverse in the ways in which they can manage their metabolism. And this accounts for their ecological diversity, that they can live in a wide variety of habitats. It accounts for their utility to humans and things like uh, bioremediation, because we can use um, 
bacteria to digest complex organic molecules like oil pollutant materials as a way of cleaning up pollution. And it also accounts for their really important role in global change, the evolution of oxygen changing the atmosphere, uh, their role in the nitrogen cycle. So bacteria are absolutely crucial to the functioning of life on Earth and archaea. Now, <clears throat> here's a picture of the phylogeny of bacteria and archaea. And we see that this just represents their, those two domains, the domain bacteria, the domain archaea, and then the major lineages within each. So you have the Fumifutes, Spirochiates, Actinobacteria, Chlamydiae, Cyanobacteria, Delta Protobacteria, Epsilon Protobacteria, Alpha Protobacteria, Beta Protobacteria, Gamma Protobacteria as the major lineages within the domain bacteria. Now, I'm not going to ask you to memorize these names, so put, don't put your energy there. Um, but this is what we know about the big outlines of the phylogeny of bacteria and of archaea. Well, what do these things look like in, in the real world? Well, here's an example. This is uh, vermiculite and yogurt. It's lactobacillus. So this is the rod-shaped cellular structures. Here's a spirochiate. Spirochiates are um, interesting because, they, among other things, they, they're a disease-causing organism. Um, Lyme disease and syphilis are both the result of spirochiates. Streptomyces, we get some of our important antibiotics from like streptomycin from streptomyces. Cyanobacteria, this is a picture of a very common cyanobacterium called Nostoc. Nostoc um, is often found on ponds and so forth. It does two things which are really fundamental. It does photosynthesis, it's a photosynthetic bacterium, and it also fixes nitrogen. So, a very important bacterium with these beautiful sort of green filamentous chains. Chlamydiae. Um, this, this group of bacteria only live within animal cells, also a source of some human diseases. Proteobacteria. Well, remember we went through that list of different proto proteobacteria. Some of them are quite striking cells. Uh, this colobacter with a stalk and a sort of sausage-shaped body, um, another with the very impressive fruiting bodies. So it's a huge amount of morphological diversity in the bacteria. And that's, that's all I'm really going to say about this. Um, the, your book says a little more. And all of these pictures are in your book, but this is just designed to give you some visual sense of what bacteria look like when you can look at them under the microscope. What about archaea? Well, archaea live in almost every habitat imaginable, including extreme habitats. Archaea are famous as extremophiles. I mentioned that uh, with this one small exception, there are no known parasitic archaea. And the domain archaea, it, at this point, we think is composed of two major lineages, but work on archaea is, is still in its very early phases because remember, it's only been in the last 30 years or so that the archaea have even been recognized as a separate domain of life and the primary tool that was available for investigating them was the uh, use of DNA sequencing as a way of discovering new lineages. So our knowledge of the, of the archaea is still relatively rudimentary compared to the bacteria. Here's some pictures of archaeal habitats. This is uh, archaea which live in sulfur-rich hot springs. 
It's called Sophilobus species. Here are archaea which live in, this halobacterium, live in salt ponds, which are saturated salt ponds. Uh, as saline as it's possible to get, and you can imagine the osmotic pressure living in this kind of physical environment, but they have adapted to it and live in it. So you've got archaea living in these very, very extreme and difficult habitats, having adapted to high temperatures, uh, over 100 degrees centigrade, or extreme salt conditions or other extreme conditions. So life is very tenacious. Life can, has managed to inhabit environments that we would have thought uh, impossible 50 years ago. And so that's just a, a hint about archaea. Now I want to turn to a, a different topic, which is a kind of an interesting one. Uh, you know, we've, we've talked about phylogenies, uh, things tracing back to a single common origin and so forth, but does genetic material ever get passed between widely different lineages? In fact, we, remember we, when we talked about species, we said one of the major criteria for things being different species is that they cannot reproduce, so they can't exchange genetic material, the lineages are therefore independent in an evolutionary sense, but are there cases where DNA not get transferred across broad lineages? And we're going to see a couple of examples of that which have been really fundamental to the evolution of life on Earth. In the bacterial world, gene transfer is not uncommon. And in fact, a lot of the emergence of drug resistance for important um, things like tuberculosis are the result of the transfer of pieces of DNA between widely different lineages that contain the coding for enzymes that can detoxify antibiotics. So in, in the case of bacterial cells, bacteria often have a chromosomal piece of DNA, which is a circular chromosome of DNA, but they also have small accessory DNAs called plasmids. And not infrequently, plasmid DNA can be transferred widely between different bacterial lineages. And this is especially the case when there is very strong natural selection by antibiotics for the success of those kinds of transfer events. So horizontal gene transfer, meaning the transfer of genes for, between broadly different lineages, occurs in nature. Now, I, I, here's a wonderful case, though, which really is one of the kind of big events in the history of life on Earth. This, this phylogeny represents what we, what we would think a priori. If we were living on a different planet and, and the connections of life on Earth were described to us, we might hypothesize that photosynthesis arose at one point in the evolution of life and proceed in, in all of the derivative photosynthetic organisms originated out of that particular lineage. But that's not what happened. And I've already alluded to this. What happened, <clears throat> which is partly depicted in this diagram, if you look at the green lineage called Plantiae, sometime early in eukaryotic evolution, an endosymbiotic association arose between a cyanobacterial prokaryote, bacterium, and a primitive <coughs> eukaryotic cell. 
And <clears throat> this kind of symbiotic association is not unusual in life. Um, if both partners benefit from the symbiotic association, it will be favored. So how might this have happened? Well, it's possible that a primitive eukaryotic cell ingested, say, by endophagosis, a cyanobacterium, and the association between them became established. The cyanobacterium continued to perform photosynthesis, and it was able to donate ATP, or the products of photosynthesis, to its host cell. The host cell provided protection from external threats, and so the two, so the association became established. So all plants represent a hybrid between a bacterial lineage, a cyanobacterial-like lineage, and a eukaryotic lineage. And if you look at today's, the chloroplast in plant cells today, the chloroplast is the residual organelle, which is the result of that endosymbiotic association. How do we know that? Well, there's a, a l number of lines of evidence that support what I'm telling you. The best line of evidence is that the chloroplast organelle has its own DNA molecule. That DNA molecule is about 200,000 bases in size, codes for 80 or so genetic functions. And <clears throat> those, and, and it has its own protein synthesizing machinery. It encodes its own ribosomes. But they're bacterial-like ribosomes, not ribosomes associated with eukaryotic organisms. And if we look at the genes encoded in the chloroplast genome, we find that many of them have homologs, which are similar, in the cyanobacterial genome. Then if we sequence a plant genome, which was first done a little over 10 years ago, we discover that several hundred genes within the chromosomal DNA of plants apparently had a bacterial origin. The rest of the 30 or 40,000 plant genes have a eukaryotic origin, but those that had a bacterial origin were simply transferred over time from the genome of the primordial endosymbiont into the nuclear genome of plants. Wonderful example of horizontal gene transfer. So the origin of photosynthesis in plants is not because it evolved de novo, but because it arose from an endosymbiotic association between a eukaryotic cell and a cyanobacterial cell. But the story doesn't stop there. After that event, several other secondary endosymbiotic events took place, transferring photosynthesis to other separate eukaryotic lineages. So, for example, the diatoms, from which dinoflagellates is an example, um, and diatoms, which are photosynthetic, actually got photosynthesis from a secondary endosymbiotic association between a red alga and the eukaryotic lineage that eventually diverged into dinoflagellates, dino, diatoms, and brown algae. The um, euglenoids, euglena, which is a protist, and we'll talk more about protists today, got <coughs> its ability to photosynthesize from a secondary endosymbiotic association with a green algae. So there's been this proliferation of endosymbiotic events which have spread photosynthesis 
through a number of eukaryotic lineages. A wonderful example of horizontal gene transfer. Now I mentioned on the last lecture and your text also talks about the origin of the mitochondrial genome or the, or the my, mitochondria and the organelle which is responsible for energy metabolism in eukaryotic cells. Uh, performs oxidative phosphorylation. Well that actually arose from an endosymbiotic association between an alpha proteobacterium and a eukaryotic cell probably more than one and a half billion years ago, right at the base of the uh, early in the evolution of the eukaryotic lineage. So the first event was the acquisition of oxidative phosphorylation. This was the capability of using oxygen as an electron acceptor in this newly oxygenated world was acquired by eukaryotes from a gene transfer, the transfer of a whole genome through an endosymbiotic association with an alpha proteobacterium and then later, perhaps a billion years ago or so, photosynthesis was, was also acquired by some uh, eukaryotic lineages through a different set of endosymbiotic associations. So early in the history of life on Earth, there's been a profusion of big genetic transfer events which have created the world that we live in as, as the biological world that we know today. Okay. So there's, there's a section in your textbook on this subject as well and you should look at it. Now we're going to turn to the topic of protists. Okay. So um, what are protists? Well, protist is, a, is kind of an artificial category. It's a category that, that was, that seemed consistent to 19th and early 20th century biologists before they had the powerful tools we have today to look at phylogenetic relationships. So one of the things that early biologists thought was that the protists were a separate branch of life from the branches that gave rise to animals and plants and fungi. And we now know that's not true. But the term protist hangs on even though it's not an appropriate description for a monophyletic clade. So we, we say that the protists are paraphyletic. That's because it's an evolutionary group that includes an ancestral population and some, but not all of its descendants. Some of those descendants in that clade are the animals, plants, and fungi, which are not included in the term protist, even though um, they're part of an evolutionary group. Protists tend to live in environments that uh, are surrounded by water. And one of the important things about protists, there are many important things about protists, but one that we'll touch upon is that sexual reproduction evolved in protists. So here's a picture of the protists. And this diagram just illustrates this notion that a that they are paraphyletic. Embedded within this monophyletic clade, which represents all of the yellow lineages, are the green plants, fungi, and animals. So they're all part of that monophyletic clade, but the name protist does not include them, and that's why the protists are said to be paraphyletic. So here's some pictures of protists. About 10% about of um, species on, on the earth are thought to be protists. One of the distinctive and beautiful protists are the diatoms, which have these siliconaceous shells. 
beautiful sort of geometric shapes, capable of photosynthesis. Um, another example, by the way, multicellularity also evolved in protists. Um, it is evolved independently numerous times. Some bacteria are also multicellular. But we see um, giant protists like kelp and um, in intertidal habitats, red algae. These are all protists, generally growing in environments surrounded by water. So what are the impacts of protists on human health and welfare? Well, several types of protists cause human disease. And one really interesting example is Phytophthora infestans. Phytophthora is a protist which infects potatoes and causes potato blight, the rotting of potatoes in the ground. The potato is actually a domesticate of Peru and South America. But it was in, introduced, like many, many important crop plants today, it was introduced into Europe following the European invasion of the Americas. And it became, because the climate was appropriate and it was easy to grow and propagate, it became a food staple in Ireland in the um, 1800s. 17 to 1800s. The other thing about potatoes is that they are very, as many of you know, they're very easy to propagate asexually because you can simply cut them up and they will grow asexually. What does that mean? That means you're propagating a single genotype, right? Because you're propagating them asexually rather than sexually. So they all have, all of the asexual propagules have the same genotype. So the protists were, well, protists, uh, potatoes were introduced into Ireland, became a staple food crop, and then in the 1840s, Phytophthora infestans attacked the Irish potato crop. And because the potato had become the primary source of sustenance in Ireland, it created a a huge famine and so around 1845 roughly 10% of the Irish population starved to death because of this single agricultural infection and about 3 million Ireland at that stage only had about 6 million inhabitants about 3 million of them migrated to North America or Australia or New Zealand so that the population of Ireland was actually reduced by 50% because of the Irish potato famine. And it had an effect on the politics of this country. One of our famous presidents was of Irish descent. His ancestors came to America in the 1840s. Another very important protist disease is malaria. Malaria is probably the most important disease of humans today because about 300 million people per year are, suffer from malaria. And about a million die each year because of malaria, mostly young children. So it is a huge public health issue. And in fact, it's one of the areas where the Gates Foundation has invested a lot of resources in trying to find ways to combat malaria. Uh, so there are other examples of human diseases of malaria, uh, of um, protests as well. And we'll see a table in a moment that illustrates some of those. But let's just look at the life cycle of the malarial parasite. And let's, <clears throat> let's begin at the upper left-hand corner where it says cell type that infects humans during a mosquito bite. That's 
in. That means it's haploid. So the haploid cell infects the human from a mosquito bite and then migrates to the liver where it undergoes mitotic division. So it remains haploid, undergoes mitotic divisions and then some of those malarial, some of those plasmodium cells migrate to the red blood cell, the erythrocyte, where they undergo mitosis and then meiosis. So, so they, they combine uh, to form for a short period of time a diploid, they undergo meiosis, and then the products of meiosis are released back into the bloodstream. The, individual, and in, the infected individual is bitten by a mosquito. The mosquito um, takes up the malarial parasite. The two gametes from the male and female combine in the mosquito, in the salivary glands of the mosquito, undergo meiosis. Well, they produce a, a briefly a zygotic phase called the oocyst, undergo meiosis, and the cycle is repeated. So that's the life cycle of the malarial parasite. I got one thing wrong here. They don't undergo meiosis in the red blood cell. It's only mitosis. And then um, meiosis is done in the salivary glands of the mosquito. So how do you control for malaria? Well, it turns out it's been very difficult to develop effective malarial vaccines. The easiest point to go after malaria is to go after the secondary host, the mosquito. And so one of the primary lines of attack is by controlling the mosquito population to reduce the opportunities for the transmission of the disease. Now, here's a list of other diseases which have a protist origin. Um, we talked about malaria, toxoplasma, uh, important in the brains of AIDS patients, which quickly develop a, a, you know, fungal populations. Um, many species of dinoflagellates produce toxins, which are neurotoxins, and we'll talk about that just a bit more in the context of red tides. Giardia causes diarrhea, uh, trichino trichinosis, um, which is a commonly uh, sexually transmitted disease, leshemia, skin sores that affect internal organisms, trypanosomosis, a uh, potentially fatal disease transmitted through the bites of tsetse flies and so forth. So, um, and down at the bottom is our friend Phytophthora infestans. So there are a number of human diseases which are caused by protists. So we want to understand and study protists in order to be effective in dealing with these public health issues. Now I've already hinted at the toxins produced by dinoflagellates. Um, some, in some cases, there, we have in coastal areas algal blooms, which are known as the red tide. And red tide is a, uh, a high um, abundance of dinoflagellates. And the dinoflagellates actually produce a toxin which protects them from parasites that try and live off the dinoflagellates. But shellfish accumulate, they eat, take up as food dinoflagellates through filter feeding, and they are not affected by the toxins, but they accumulate the toxins. So that when you go to collect shellfish on the beach, at a time of um, red tide, you collect shellfish which have concentrated a neurotoxin, 
which can in some cases be fatal. What's the ecological importance of protests? Well, I've already mentioned that about 10% of named eukaryotic species are protists. That number's certainly going to grow because with the tools that we have to identify new species through direct sequencing, it's almost certain that we'll find many, many more protist species as time goes on. But they have relatively low species diversity compared to some other eukaryotes. But they're important because they do photosynthesis and they are primary producers in ocean ecosystems and we'll see a figure that illustrates that in a moment. They're also important in regulating the carbon cycle on Earth and, and we'll talk a bit more about that. But first, as primary producers, photosynthetic protists and bacteria form the bottom of the food chain. And they're taken up by primary consumers and producers, which are eaten by small fish, which are eaten by bigger fish, and so forth. So they sit at the very base of the food chain and are key in that regard. The other really key thing is that they take carbon dioxide out of the air. Because many of the protists have carbonaceous outer shells or and they take and they fix this in calcium carbonate structures as they go through their life cycle and die, this, these calcium carbonate shells filter down to the bottom of the ocean and create layer upon layer of calcium carbonate shells which eventually build up over time and are compressed until you finally have the formations that we see as limestone today. That means that they're taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and sequestering it for long periods of time, geologically long periods of time. And so uh, protists play a key role in maintaining the global carbon cycle. And one idea that's been kicked around a bit is that maybe if we could increase the number of protists, we could use them as a way of sponging carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and that would mitigate global climate change. And one of the possibilities is that a key limiting resource for protist growth in the oceans is iron, particularly in some latitudes. So if you fertilize the ocean in some of the tropical latitudes with iron, you would allow a much increased population of protists and therefore a much faster uh, sequestering of, of carbon dioxide into carbonaceous materials and possibly that would help mitigate the increase in carbon dioxide due to the burning of fossil fuels. So, um, that's an untested idea, and it's one that many scientists are skeptical of, but it, this illustrates the importance of protists in the global carbon cycle. Okay, so the next topic is evaluating molecular phylogenies, and I think what I'll do is pick this up on Wednesday since it's a good point to stop at.